I was five years old. I'd been given an electrical toy for my birthday, and I didn't like the toy. But I took the wires out of the toy, and I walked to a wall plug, and I put the wires into the wall plug and held on, burned my body. My face was burnt, my eyelashes, my eyelids, my veins were burnt, my hands were burnt, and I couldn't speak. And while I was waiting for the medical people to come, there were other people in my room. My mother told me no one was in there, but I could see them. They were people that were helping to heal my body that were not of this world. Not very old, six, eight, nine years. And my grandfather, uh, I asked him, where do, the, where do our thoughts go when we die? I, I was just like, I couldn't understand. Where does our thoughts go? I remember how he looked. I don't remember what he said, but I, I remember how he looked at me. I could see that, good question. And as I was playing it, I, I went, I, it's like I came out of my body. I went into another, another period. And I was still playing the piece, but there was a chamber orchestra around me. And this was like a couple of hundred years ago. I remembered, I remembered playing there. layers and layers of energy, layers and layers of reality coming into this place. I could feel my body filled with this light and I could feel this impulse of infinite love. It was excruciatingly divine. Do you believe in this? <laughs> <laughs> There are people who were so-called spiritual people, and they would talk these beautiful words of spirit, you know? But even as a kid, you could see that they didn't live any of the words. So I really shied away from spirit. I thought, that, that's not true. But science. I'm not spiritual, right? Until this moment, and I realized, oh my God, where do I come from? Oh, the stars. Listen, my background, I'm an engineer. This is what I did for 40 years, 43 years of my life. It's extremely logical, it's very 3D, and, and everything fits in a puzzle that makes sense. I love that. When I started stepping into the esoteric, all of a sudden there were invisible things that I could not explain that did not fit into the puzzle. Three years apart, two men 40 years apart in age. Both of them had given the same phrase. There's a magnetic master named Cryon who wants to get a hold of you. It was on the tape. I heard it with my 3D ears. All I could do, and I did it without anybody around, was sit in a chair and say, okay, are you there? And nothing happened except I cried. is receiving information from a very high intelligence given the name Kryon. And the first books that were giving information was the way to inactivate a virus with magnetic. And what was amazing to me is that what was written in the book was describing exactly the types of experiments I was doing at USC with the AIDS virus. And that was rather mind-blowing. So 
Shalom. We just completed an incredible seven days tour all over Israel with an international group of over 300 people from over 35 countries. From Angola, Australia, Austria, Belgium, Brazil, Bulgaria, Canada, Chile, Colombia, Denmark, Ecuador, France, Germany, Ireland, Israel, Italy, Mexico, Netherlands, New Zealand, Nicaragua, Norway, Poland, Portugal, Russia, Singapore, Spain, Switzerland, Thailand, United Kingdom, United Arab Emirates, Uruguay, and the United States. I'd like to call Mr. Lee Carroll. You're interviewing for the first time an esoteric channeler, which almost nobody believes is real. When I speak about Kryon says this and Kryon says that, you know, this sounds really strange to people. So I just wanted to know. As an engineer, you have to understand there was a bridge to cross. My wife at the time, she took me to a channeler. I didn't want to go, but it was her birthday, so I went. This man sat in front of me and did basically what I do today. I laughed, I didn't believe it, but it was recorded. Three years later, she said, there's another guy I want you to see. And I said, no. She said, look, it's only gonna be 15, 20 minutes, come on. So I went and I didn't like it, and I told her, never again. And then I got to thinking about something, and that is I heard them both say something that was interesting. They both said the word cryon. Greetings, dear ones, I'm cryon of magnetic service. And so now we are in Tel Aviv, in front of over 900 souls. Is the man in the chair pretending? Or is there something here? I want you to take a moment and look at the reality that is before you now. Listening to a man in a chair, and you're told it is the voice from beyond. There is always the question, is it real? Can humans find a time when they will allow space for what they don't believe is possible? It's not going to take long before your scientists start to see what I'm going to be calling the field. The field is a benevolent, harmonious vibration. If you harmonize with it, with your consciousness, you activate your cellular structure. Those who could totally and completely harmonize with the field can control physics. We sit in the southern part of Israel with a view that is amazing. And we're almost at the beginning of the tour because that's what we said originally, didn't we? We said to you, no matter what you see in the next few days, look for God inside. Can you do this, really, really? I was born a sensitive kid. I was always aware of that there was something out there. About the age of 40, I was walking on Harrow on the Hill. We lived in London then. Halfway up the hill, suddenly it's like somebody sticks a Cuban cigar in my back and it's hot and it's like burning. Even the dog stopped and he looks at me. I look at him and go, oh, something's happening. When you light gas, you have this whoosh, and it's lit all at the same time. That's how it felt. I became within 30 seconds an electro-hypersensitive. 
I suddenly have the feeling of like moving fields around my body. So I went up, sat quietly under a tree and I started playing with my hands with what I could actually feel. And that was the beginning. You feel hot, cold, tingling, movement, blood flow. You can be pulled, you can be pushed, you can be affected from hundreds of meters. It is not connected to distance. It's the ether, the field. We are emerging from fingers. We all light beings. We all emanate photons all the time. So we are emerging light coming from your fingers in electromagnetic field. I invented this instrument about 20 years ago. This system is designed for doctors. They can detect very detailed analysis of human condition. My name is Konstantin Korotkov. I'm a scientist, professor in quantum physics, biophysics, laser physics, atmospheric physics, cosmic physics, medicine, constructing different instruments, more than 200 papers published in peer journals, 11 books translated to many languages. So, of course, I was pure materialistic. My name is Bruce Lipton. I started out as a young child with a Russian Jewish father in the United States in the McCarthy period. When I grew up in that McCarthy period, no matter how much they were against Russians and Jews, Albert Einstein was a hero of the world. And he was a Jew, and so Albert Einstein was my hero. That led me into science. I ended up teaching in a medical school and I was teaching the conventional science of genes control your life. And this is an experiment that I did that changed my whole life. I have 50,000 genetically identical cells in a Petri dish. All the cells came from the same parent. I split the cells into three different Petri dishes. I changed the environment in each of the dishes. In environment A, the cells form muscle. In environment B, the cells form bone. In environment C, the cells form fat cells. Now you're left with a question. What controls the fate of the cells? And the answer is not the genes. They were all exactly the same. The only thing that was different was the environment. But at this time, which is back in the early 70s, all the scientific world was so wrapped up in genes that when I tried to show my experiments, my colleagues looked at it and said, no, that's, you know, there's just an artifact. It's not real. I left the system. I knew I was teaching the wrong information, that genes do not control things. Next one. We had this experiment in Mr. Ramon, and the idea was to see whether we can detect influence to people from different parts of the world. We had uh, five cameras. All those cameras were synchronized with our scientific instruments. All experiments was done in blind way, so people did not know at which moment they start to influence. There's layers around the body, and they go from one millimeter from the skin and out to a certain field around the body. Between the skin and the edge of that field, there's a lot other more fields. When I start off by almost touching and then I move slowly backwards, I am looking for the field that gives me the strongest sensation in the palm of the hand. When I find the right field, 
that field will start pulsing. Now the pulse to me is just about the most mystical thing in the world because I have no idea what the pulse is. This sensitivity exists in all children up to the age of three. And then conditioning and I'm big, you're small. I'm smart, you're stupid. I tell you how the world is. Yeah, but that weight, no, 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 no. I tell you how the world is. What I do, I believe anybody can do. I got 20 years of practice, but you can all do it. There's no mystery here. Energy increased dramatically. Different holes, uh, they are related to different dysfunctions of the body. Before, it was many holes, and after, it became much more rounded. It is no doubts that it was a really clear effect. My name is Trum Aronsen. I am a Moxiteka, a closed, open-hand practitioner. I left the system and I started to study quantum physics. In Newtonian physics, we say everything is mechanical. And then we created the picture of an atom, like a little solar system with electrons spinning around. That's a mechanical picture created from a mechanical belief. Nobody saw the atom, that was just a, an idea. But around 1895, they started to say, what makes up an atom? And they started to find there's something inside the atom. Oh, well, there are electrons in the atom. There's a nucleus in the atom. They said, oh, smaller particles. But then, as they started to look at, so what makes up an electron? What makes up a proton or a neutron? They found out inside of those things there's nothing but energy. The universe is made out of energy. The physicists call it the field. The field of what? Invisible energy. Energy not seen. It touches you in ways that are fascinating. What is that? Wouldn't you like to bottle it and take it home and analyze it and you can't? Truly, what is this? Instead of looking and saying, maybe there are missing laws of physics we don't know about. But this is the human propensity. Take what is known. Observe what is unknown but there and place it into the boxes of the known. Even if they don't make sense, even if they're mysterious. Welcome to dark matter. Let me tell you one of the biggest places that you're missing. The place of the physics of consciousness. I worked in the Princeton Engineering Anomalies Research Laboratory till I retired in 2002. But in 1997, I started the Global Consciousness Project. What we have done is to create a network up to about 70 sites around the world. We have a random number generator attached to a computer which collects data continuously. A random number generator is diode and a circuit that pushes electrons through a barrier. We sample a tiny voltage and we convert that into ones and zeros. If the voltage is high, it's a one. If the voltage is low, it's a zero. We usually gather every second 200 of those ones and zeros. So we have from many of these random number generators streams of data we extract the data and draw a cumulative deviation graph. What's expected is for that graph to go up a little, down a little, and does not have a trend. But when some kind of information being added because of consciousness, we'll see a trend upward or downward persistently. There is a correlation between the state of consciousness a person may have and the way these numbers develop. My name is Roger Nelson. I am the creator and the director of the Global Consciousness Project.
He's a five-time New York Times best-selling author and is internationally renowned as a pioneer in bridging science, spirituality, and human potential. Ladies and gentlemen, Grotavir Votai, Kablu et Greg Braden. Elon, my brother. Nice re-RG. Elon and I began putting this program together 15 years ago. It's a beautiful graph. Between one and two, there's a pretty strong trend. It's strong enough that it would be significant. So you have a group who is creating a group consciousness field that's changing the behavior of this random number generator. For 300 years, science has asked the question, is there a field of energy that connects everything? Or is everything separate from everything else? That's the big question. The field is the energy. The field is the origin of everything. And that's what the music is actually doing. It's connecting to the field. Once you're connected to the field, you're in your power. My name is Robert Coxon. I'm a composer. And I've actually always done music since I was one and a half. And it's always been my passion. I always believed that when I studied chemistry and geology and biology and physics, that what I was doing was understanding little pieces of a greater power. It's just that people didn't talk about it. So I never separated science from spirituality. I asked the question, rather than separating science from spirituality. What if we marry these two great ways of knowing? I am a very stubborn man. The stubbornness comes from years of logic. I believe what I see. I have to find out. I have to know. So I sat down in the chair. I was alone. That is why there was only one avenue that would touch me, and that's my heart. I had such emotion, feeling of benevolence and caring and love, I never had. And I realized there's something there. It is real. You still question it. And so it takes a time to adjust for it to prove itself over and over and over for you to see, okay. Finally, I realized I would have to be on stage. That was almost death for me. The first time, it was only for 10 or 15 people. And I, I had to change shirts on the break. I was sweating so much. Oh, it was awful. I said, this is not for me. I don't want to do this. It's not me. What Cryan said is, use your life in Greece when you were an orator, one who spoke elegantly. I got in front of the crowds that got bigger and bigger, and I tried. I said, okay, I'm going to pull in who I used to be, I was relaxed with crowds and all, and you know, the more I did it, there was, that's exactly what happened. Now I don't get nervous at all. The only thing that makes me nervous is I want to deliver the right message. Let us look at the power and the physics of consciousness. Someday, there will be inventions in physics, and when they do, you will see that consciousness is energy. Consciousness, what human beings think collectively, can be measured. Changes things, moves things. Belief moves things. My name is Lynn McTaggart. I am an international award-winning author and journalist, and I've written seven books. Four of them have been about science and spirituality. Hi, everybody. I wanted to put the idea that our thoughts are an actual something with the capacity to change physical matter to the ultimate test. And I wasn't really sure this was going to work. The idea was to see whether it's possible to detect 
change of parameters of water and the influence of collective intention from other part of the world. This is our setup in St. Petersburg, Russia. The water sensor is our little bottle of water right there. Bottle of water with sensor. We apply very short electrical impulses to water. And we're measuring response of water, conductivity of water, pH of water, negative potential of water. So it's a combination of different parameters. I developed a special sensor, Sputnik. This sensor can respond to human consciousness. We're measuring distribution of standing electromagnetic waves in field. So it's physics. <laughs> in simple words, we are measuring condition of space depending on uh, amount of negative ions, positive ions, interrelation between them, and of course radioactivity as well, plus geomagnetic field. I turned on this measurement in totally automatic mode and I left the room, so I closed the door. So I didn't know at which moment they make this influence. In Miami it was daytime, in St. Petersburg it was practically midnight. Are we ready? Okay. A deep breath in, and a deep breath out. Deep breath in. Visualize that bottle of water. See yourself connecting with it. See your mind traveling all the way over to St. Petersburg and sending intention to that water. Our intention is to send love to this water so that it becomes part of our hearts and becomes pure and more alkaline. Keep feeling the connection with everybody in the room. One big consciousness. back into the room. We ran a water experiment yesterday, remember it? We didn't affect pH. We didn't change the light emissions, but we had an extraordinary effect on the environment around that water. Every bar, it is 10 minutes measurement. It was an hour and a half, 90 minutes. All of that blue, is when it was turned on, all of the green is when I started talking. The red is that little 10 minute window of you doing your intention. Signal was, had some variations and then signal tremendously dropped down. It means a calmness, your calmness, have an effect on a little bottle of water thousands and thousands of miles away. This threshold opens a door. A door in what you have called the field, where there is no time, there is no space, there is not a place, it just is. Some say the field is the other side of the veil. Some say the field is a magic place where your soul can go and relax for a little while before it comes back. Keep holding the tone. We are floating in the Sea of Galilee. When you float, you are not connected to the land. None of you right now are grounded. So we're going to talk now about the soul. Dear ones, you never die. 
This is not a new age belief. Go back as far as you can and find the texts of the belief of those Hindus and those Buddhists thousands of years before your prophets. What was the staple of their belief? The soul returns. Intuitive, common sense, spiritually made sense. Me and my twin brother, Hemant Kumar Bhadudi, he is an astrologer and also practice the purest form of the Tantra. We live in Varanasi. This city is very ancient and a center for knowledge. We have collection of 80,000 books and manuscripts in our house that collected by my grandfather. Tantra, Yoga, Astrology, Ayurveda and Philosophy, also alchemy in these books. Some of them are really very old, more than 1,000 years. The government of India is helping us. They scanning. Till now, they calculate 7,732 manuscripts. My grandfather, when he was 21 years old, he left everything and started his spiritual life. He did tapa. Tapa means when we follow the divine, when we alone from the society. Even though Sage Bhrigu left his body many thousand years ago, he appears to my grandfather and he blessed him with the knowledge, ancient knowledge, how energy is active everywhere. I'm Dr. Jayant Kumar Bhaduri. I'm Ayurvedic doctor. I'm practicing Bhrigu Yoga. This knowledge I got through my father and he got this through his father, Sri Sudhir Ranjan Bhaduri Mahashay. According to Indian philosophy, soul is observer, inside. It bakashti la shevet besheket, bemeshach kesha. Yadati shematai shu, doctor baduri sholech li energia mehodu. אבל לא ידעתי מתי זה מתחיל, מתי זה נגמר, ואם זה בכלל שודר. לא היה לי מושג. This universe is a part of infinity. So there are many energy channels in this infinite. I use them to transfer this energy from me to Ayala. We believe that everything is one. So this one active and activate all energy channels in one form. So Ayala is not separate with me. I feel that she is very near to me. I was a very strict physicist, but I was interested to study what is going on after death. So I organized a big research, had a team of doctors, medical professionals. We've been studying people immediately after death, been measuring their bodies and their progress of their energy. 
once I have a call from one guy who told me, Constantine, something is very strange happening. Can you come? It was in the hospital where we kept this body. I entered and I really feel that someone is looking to me. I feel it. I was able even to detect where this spirit is settled. When we have this Sputnik in the room, we expect to have all parameters stable. If there are no moon eclipse, sun eclipse, or no equipment running around. When we see some peaks on this signal, then it means that it was something influencing this particular one. It was very clear proof for me that all these metaphysical ideas, it's not just imagination, it is a representation of very deep wisdom, very deep knowledge about another side of life. איתו הרגשתי צורך לפתוח את העיניים, והרגשתי ערנית. This is measurement from random generator. And this measurement from Sputnik. As we had the time code on both graphs, we were able to see that when he finished, we had this strong peak on both graphs. We did this measurement twice to be sure that it's not just random variations. In this second experiment, he enters this increase of signal. Then he starts meditating. Again, it's increase of signal and signal is coming up. Then it's coming, coming, coming. Then he stops, but signal still is coming up. It's after effect. If you put these two graphs together, you see it's practically the same. Different type of measurement. It's amazing. Thousands and thousands of kilometers from India to Israel. Dr. Baduri was able to change physical process. And what does mean physical process? It means physical reality. I wish to speak of the prophet Elijah. Pretend for a moment to serve Elijah, the name of Elisha. And Elijah comes to you and says, I want you to write it down. Because I have chosen my time to ascend. Transformation began. A light as bright as the sun. It was almost too bright to see to look at. Alicia was touched. He almost couldn't write, he couldn't speak. Because he felt that light. He knew that light. He was seeing something. He was seeing the soul of Elijah. As Elijah began to raise in this vehicle and ride within him, Alicia continued to watch, and then Elijah was gone. He wrote it as best he could, and you can find it today in the old scriptures. First human who got to see the higher self. That's what the higher self looks like. If you could see what's in you, the eyes that Alicia had, You would see the same light. All over the world, they know that word. To ride in the beautiful chariot. Almost like you're going home. I've waited a long time to sit where it happened. Same dirt, the same place. Now we tell you this is simply the DNA field fully activated. There's a field around you. It's a DNA field. It's a consciousness field. It is not your brain. Consciousness is not biology. It is the quantum portion of the DNA. The 90% that is not understood by science 
is the quantum portion. Science very often, unfortunately, goes through dogmas. DNA is one of these dogmas. Only 1% is coding DNA. These are the genes. And for a long time it was thought that all the remnant of the DNA, 95, 98, 99%, was just junk DNA, was garbage. Now we know that this is absolutely not true. In order to understand what the code is, uh, we have to go to the vibration. My name is Carlo Ventura. I'm a cardiologist. I'm a full professor of molecular biology in the School of Medicine at the University of Bologna. And I'm the director of the National Laboratory of Molecular Biology and Stem Cell Engineering at the National Research Council in Bologna. I was very, very young, maybe less than 10. And uh, I saw my mother, uh, she was sick. I promised myself that uh, even if I, I could not see um, what was making her being sick, I will find it and I will cure her. Then I decided to, to, to become a doctor. Since I was a kid, I was fascinated by playing with the invisible. Playing with the invisible means playing with the information, playing with the energies, playing with forces. These forces, they have intelligence. Isaac Newton didn't put God or invisible forces or spirit. He just measured physical things. So the body, being a part of a mechanical universe, is a machine. So well, how do you understand how the machine works? Take it apart, study the pieces. So they were taking apart the body. They found there were cells. And then they took the cells apart, and they found that cells are made out of protein. And the question is, who makes proteins? It was in 1944 that the first study revealed that if you took DNA from one species and put it into a bacterial culture of a different species, the bacterial culture would start to resemble the bacteria where the DNA came from. So then they said, well, the DNA makes a protein. The next question is, who makes the DNA? Well, this is where science got screwed up. DNA is a double helix. In an experiment, they separated the double helix, so I have two single helices. And they put those into a solution of building blocks. And they pulled it out, and it was a double helix again. The answer is clear. DNA makes itself, and DNA makes the proteins. The end of the search. Once they found the DNA was important, they threw away the protein. Well, they threw out the control. The control was in the protein. And proteins respond to environmental signals. Inside this dark area, which is the nucleus, you have two meters of DNA, each folding, each loop of the DNA. It has a vibrational code, it has an electromagnetic emission. It's like flying, it's continuously vibrating. Nothing is, is stable. Our genes working as a symphony, and that's the symphony of life. information which led me on the path of electromagnetic research with lasers, that it began with a vision, a vision of DNA. The vision that I had was that DNA is more than just physical chemistry. The information that was profound was that the structure of DNA, coils within coils, DNA was also creating electromagnetic frequency information and that the DNA in the body was communicating with each other instantaneously, like radios. The critical information was that by sending electromagnetic frequency information, we could literally vibrate DNA, instruct DNA, give it the information, either for sick cells to become healthy or old cells to become young. You have hundreds of thousands of molecules. They can exchange 
vibrations across these cables, all over around the field. It's one field. This is chemistry, but it's a kind of dancing chemistry, and you can talk to this chemistry with physics. The outer surface of the cell membrane is there are little antennas called receptors. And the receptors are responding to environmental signals. This is what changed my whole life in a minute because uh, I wasn't spiritual. I realized it's not the antennas, it's the signal coming to the antennas. I'm uh, like a television set, I'm playing the Bruce show, but the broadcast is coming in. And if the body dies, broadcast is still there, just like a television set. I'm Dr. Tato Vakaitis. I am a medical doctor. My highest level training was as a specialist in pulmonary and intensive care medicine. With that background, I began to study laser biophysics and the ways that laser interact with biology. In 2010, when I produced the DNA book, we still thought that 90% of DNA was not functional. They called it junk DNA. It was only in 2012, I think, that they discovered what it did. And it does what Cryon said it did in Cryon Book 10. The field is a sub-reality that contains the potentials of everything that exists the potentials of the future. Precognition is simply the identification of what is already there. It's just not the time for it yet, but it exists. It becomes a little bit difficult to understand the nature of such an intelligence, cryon. But the information provided is particularly scientific. And I've been with Lee all over the world. I've seen this phenomenon time and time again. It is our ability to tune our hearts and minds into an energetic field in a way that allows information to be conveyed from one realm to the next. You can pull that information from the field. Intuition means you've tapped into the knowledge that has been stored in that field. The really good pieces, I don't feel that I'm writing them. And if I look at my CDs, and I, the, the most magical pieces on there, I have a very hard time saying, I, Robert Coxon, wrote that. It's coming through. I don't know where my hands are gonna go, but they go to the right place if I let them. I love the idea of setting the empty chair. The chair is filled. But when crime comes in, I go away. When I first started, I thought, what if I have a whole auditorium full of people and I sit in the chair and crime doesn't come? <laughs> that was the biggest fear I had for the first few years. Then I realized it's not gonna come in. It's already here. <laughs> no angels are separate from the one God. We put them there. Brian says, you've called me a name because that makes you comfortable. He says, on the other side of the veil, there is a collective, what you call God, billions and billions of energies with one consciousness. We sit on the Mount of Beatitudes. You might hear the wind blowing in the background. Here is a statement. I am that I am. These two words together, you have to group them. The statement is very clear. I am part of the creative source, a piece of God. Now I ask you, who are you? Really? As you sit there, who are you?
My name is Peggy Phoenix Dubro, and you're asking me, who am I? I woke up when I was 22. That defines me. I was raised Christian, and I had learned that God was my father in my religion. But I didn't feel this love. My own childhood, I came from a pretty dark and dirty place. And my father, he was a paranoid schizophrenic alcoholic, and he was very abusive to my brother and sister and I, and I was the oldest. That's what drove me. I needed to know God the Father. So I sat quietly in the living room, and I wrote, I want to remember God in every cell of my body, in, in this time, in this place, in this moment. It was like veils of reality fell away. Layers and layers of energy. And then I could feel my body filled with this light and energy. I only knew I'm in this space that I just experienced the most exquisite divine love ever. And I just wanted to share it, that I just wanted to tell people God is real and God loves us as we are. The first thing I did after having that experience is I went to the elders of my church. The elders of the church said, we know who you are. We know where you live. We know what your life is like. You're dirty. Why would God talk to you? There was just no way. So I went quiet, and then I began to study. Fifteen years in deep study. And then I had a second experience. And this light structure started to radiate out, and the structure of the lattice showed itself. So it's fibers of light and energy. It's an extension of our sympathetic and parasympathetic nervous system that has feedback loops, infinity feedback loops that radiate. It is a system in our energy anatomy, like an energetic skin. And I started to see the lattice in people's energy fields. I've learned how to read the fibers of light and energy and what they have to say. We are light. We have a symbol we use. You make the symbol, the person doesn't know. It's like an antenna just, just telling the universe, beep, 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 beep it dials up a resonance within you and within the person you're working with. It's a vibrational frequency that Divine Matrix understands. This is interesting that it was a big jump of parameters very unexpected jump. But as we had time caught on the cameras, it was found that at this particular moment, this lady Tamar, she put her hand to her heart. And if we look to her parameters, then we see level of energy increased tremendously. Maybe she felt something. That's why she put her hand to her uh, heart. Distance does not matter. I'm not a scientist, I don't understand all this. I, I know that principles of it make me feel good. There's a scientific study by a man called Cleve Baxter. He took cells from a human, put them in a Petri dish, and moved them 40 miles away. They began to show powerful images to the person that had donated the cells. Graphic images of war, destruction, comedy, humor, sexual images, anything to elicit a genuine, emotional response. The instant, the instant that the person had the emotion, his cells acted as if they were still in his body having the same emotion. The cells 40 miles away show the electrical activity of that response. What's the point? There's a, this person's cells are connected to this person, but they're 40 miles away. How did the information reach or did it? And the answer is it didn't have to travel. The field is holographic. 
And what that means is what happens in one part of the field influences other parts of the field in the same instant. And this is deeply, deeply profound. Our thoughts are not contained in our head. Our thoughts are broadcast to the field. If I put wires on your head, that's called EEG electroencephalograph, I can read your brain. But there's a new technology called magnetoencephalograph. The probe doesn't touch the head. The probe is out here. I'm reading your brain activity from out here. Point? Your brain activity is being broadcast. What is a thought? Thought is a frequency. A thought emits a vibration. From the most primitive organism all the way up to humans, all of us communicate by vibration. How does them even know to go to the right place and not go to the wrong place? Vibes. For every light frequency, there is a corresponding sound frequency. For every sound frequency, there is a corresponding light frequency. Every atom has its own vibrational frequency. We have a field of vibration. We have also photons. It is light. Thought is a particle of light. We can measure it. There was an experiment conducted by a physicist named Bell. You have a photon that splits to two, and they're so far apart that a signal cannot go from one to the other without going faster than light. So the question was, if they could communicate instantly, that would mean that communication faster than the speed of light is possible if there is entanglement of the waveform. And when the experiment was done, what they discovered very interestingly was that the particles can communicate faster than light. Much as photons communicating, you can view consciousness as also having wave characteristics, which means in consciousness, we can communicate and perceive anywhere throughout the entire universe. So if thought can be measured as a wave function, as a particle of light, what does light travel? Seven times around the planet in one second. So can a thought travel like that? My name is Krishna Madhapa. I run an institute for science, spirituality, and sustainability in the US. My education has been engineering sciences, mechanical industrial engineering, biophysics, and psychoneuropics. That has led me to deeper understanding into the sciences of light. We sit on the Golan Heights, where many wars were, and many Israelis will say it's only a matter of time, and there will be another, and another. Generation after generation after generation, things haven't changed. If you have a sightless person in front of you, and they've been sightless since birth, sit with them a moment, explain the spectrum of color. They don't know what they don't know. I say to Israel, you don't know what you don't know. Color is coming. When I was three years old, I was kind of drug off to our local community church. I can remember my little feet hanging over the pews. The minister was up there with a sermon talking about a vengeful God. I was looking around at the big people all standing up and doing their things. I had this deep insight at that moment. That, Wait a minute, you can't be believing this. This was utter nonsense. I grew up in a, a small farming community and my grandfather was the mechanic for the community. He fixed all the tractors and cars, and I would spend a lot of time hanging out with him. So I developed very early on a natural curiosity for how things work. What are radio waves and electricity? I was never satisfied with our explanations of what is an electric field or what is a magnetic field. 
as I then went to college and became an electrical engineer and worked for Motorola, fixing high-level communication systems. That really didn't feel like it was my path. Something was just missing. Another sports car in the driveway wasn't going to do it. There was still that deeper hole, something to really, that I was really here to help humanity. deeply understood, not just mentally, that it's about consciousness, it's not about technology. Technology is not going to solve the world's problems until consciousness shifts. I'm Dr. Roland McCready. I am Director of Research at the HeartMath Institute. We sent a number of these devices to Israel. A number of people wore them at the same time so we could see how their nervous system responded to these different activities, whether it was meditating, singing, being in parts of channeling sessions, and so on. Keep the tone as soft as you can. Just keep the tone going and listen to the others as if we were one voice, as if we were all one voice, very softly. If we look at this graph here, we see that during a meditation, the four people here that were being monitored at the same time there's a lot of differences during the meditation, but really interestingly, after that, when some singing was going on, we see a very clear change in the patterns of three of the four people. Very nice period of coherence occurred. Coherence has a very unique pattern. It's a very distinct, different pattern than the rest of the rhythms. We know from many, many studies over many years, close to 400 independent studies now have shown it's a very beneficial state. Blood pressure is reduced. Hormonal balance shifts to more positive ratios. Keep that tone. It's really when we have heartfelt emotions of connection with others, love, care, compassion. These positive, regenerating feelings take us naturally into this very optimal state that we call coherence. I can share who I really am through music, my voice. Just be able to close my eyes and go in that space. For me, it's more like it happens now. Right now. When I sing, that's when I pray. As I wrote in my song, you know, the one that starts to do to do to do to do to do Something's going on that I can't explain. No matter how much I use my brain. My name is Anas Holte. I'm from Denmark. My education was as a classical singer and conductor. My work changed completely direction. 1991, I had a professor. She devoted her life to voice work with people. One evening, she just all of a sudden gave me a book. It was a book, like so many books, that talks about the possibility that there is a greater universe, a greater existence happening beyond just this 3D world. And I was reading this and I was crying and crying and crying and crying because it touched a point in me as if someone had recognized me. Oh, there is this option, I can feel this again. Oh yeah. And when I was singing, I began to realize much more clearly what is going on when I do that. I had always loved it, but the consciousness was the difference. Because when I sing, that's when, that's when I pray. Hey, 
Is this beautiful? This is John. John. <laughs> Where are you? Good question. We didn't know that. We're in the field. <laughs> this is John. We found our scientist. How cool is that? So I think we can. <laughs> Look at that. Thank you. <laughs> hey, John, we made it. How are you? This is good to see you, oh, man. Good to this see is you. good. Oh, good to I see got, you. I can't tell you how glad I was to hear your voice here oh, at the end. Oh, wow. Christina, oh, how are you? Oh. Wonderful to see you. This must be the most beautiful located laboratory in the world. I don't know about that, but it's certainly a beautiful spot, isn't it? Oh, my wow. God. Oh, I'm looking forward. <laughs> It all started back at the Great Pyramid in 1997. Three weeks before I was due to go out to Egypt, I severely injured my lower back. I thought I would have to cancel the whole mission, but somehow I managed to get into the pyramid. Other people carried the equipment. The experiment that was designed was to make visible the resonances in the sarcophagus. I set up the experiment then I stretched PVC membrane across the open top of the sarcophagus. Then I sprinkled sand on the membrane. And when we switched on the sound, this is just pure tones, electronically created tones. A whole range of ancient Egyptian hieroglyphs started to appear in the sand. First one was the hieroglyph for backbone, or spinal column. It was writhing about like a snake. Antiquities inspector, he was like, how you do that? How you do that? We saw lots and lots of different hieroglyphs coming out on this membrane. But what was so extraordinary was within 20 minutes of making sound, all the pain in my back left me and I never did come back. It's an extraordinary moment in my life that changed my life forever. My name is John Stuart Reed, and I'm an acoustic physics researcher. Pythagoras said that music could be used in place of medicine. It got my attention, and I thought, there must be some experiments that could be conducted where we can carefully measure the response of music to some sort of healing situation. The first experiment that I conceived of was using blood. You take a vial of blood and you place it into an incubator with a small loudspeaker in the incubator that's feeding music to that blood. At the same time that that's happening, we have another vial of the same blood we have a Faraday cage, which is electromagnetically screened, but it's also a very, very quiet environment. So that blood is not receiving any music, it's just receiving quiet.
We go through a protocol that first dilutes the blood by a certain ratio with a buffer solution, and then we extract a small amount of that mixed blood. When we put that blood into the cell counter, it will tell us how many cells are actually live and what the term is viable. The cells in the Faraday cage have not fared very well at all. Mostly dead. But if the cells are dead, that means that the cells from the tube that got exposed to my voice, they'll be dead too. I mean, it's the same blood. I think we should probably repeat that though and see if we get the same result. Let's try counting the cells. Still the same with that sample. <laughs> I hope you can see this. Dilute the sample. More cells alive than the cell counter can count. That's a huge difference between the music and the quiet. Is, is, is that true? Well, look. <laughs> this is amazing. So I think we should repeat and see if we get the same result. Another count. Above the range that it can count, cells that are transiting towards being dead have been actually re-enlivened to the extent that so many of them are now alive. Just really wonderful. <laughs> An amazing result. Absolutely amazing. When we have a heartbeat, it creates a pressure wave and that allows the hemoglobin molecules take in some oxygen from the blood. The low frequencies from Anders' voice are creating the similar sort of pressure waves that allows the blood to uptake the oxygen. People say, okay, Bruce, you're studying cells in a plastic Petri dish. What does that have to do with me? It doesn't make a difference to the cell if it's in a plastic dish or a skin dish. It still responds to environmental signals. So the environment is controlling the cells. But between the environment and the cells is the mind. And that does interpretation. If you open your eyes and see someone you love, your mind interprets love. And you release beautiful chemicals. Dopamine for pleasure, oxytocin for bonding. If I take the chemicals from brain that perceives love and put them into a plastic Petri dish, the cells grow beautifully. If I take the chemicals from a brain that perceives fear, the cells stop growing and they start dying. So you're the one whose thoughts change the chemistry and the chemistry controls the genetics. So all of a sudden, you're not a victim of your genes, you're the master of your genes. We are on Mount Hermon, and it allows a view into Lebanon and Syria. Not too far from here, a dark army without borders. Consciousness you have carried around for eons and eons, and the darkness that you have seen could fill libraries. Where do you take your cue from? I'll tell you, from the past. Isn't it time to change that? You can change the past because of what the future holds. It means that the consciousness that expects a good future will back up and change that energy that says you're nuts. It's gonna happen again. It's gonna happen again, because it always does. Things that are happening in the future can change the past. Did you hear that? We were able to send these cells back in time. So this was our experimental model. We grew cells for more than three months. This is a critical point where the cells are completely aged. They're not able to do anything. They start to die. 
we found is that exposing our stem cells to radioelectric field, we were able to send these cells back in time. And the cells started to uh, proliferate again and to differentiate again. That means making our cells baby again. It's like a time machine. Sound, magnetic field, light are all diffusive energies. They can pass through the body. Our work has involved creating a new type of laser technology. We can take the waves that start out coherently and redefine their movement such that the waves are now exactly out of phase. And when we do that and combine the waves together, the wave patterns cancel each other out. So we've created a new form that you could almost call invisible light. When the laser is constructed in this form, it goes much more deeply than ordinary laser. Instead of stopping at the skin, we can go deep into tissue. Our earliest experiments particularly involved working with HIV. In studies done at the University of Southern California, where we completely removed the virus with no harmful effect upon the cell. Our work in Africa has taken that further, creating a combination of nutrition plus waves with extremely good results. Our most impressive case, a patient from South Africa who had virtually no immune system left, a normal CD4 count, under 200 is AIDS, and this patient started at a level of 23. Six months later, there was no detectable virus. Following him for five years, his immune system recovered to a high normal 1100. The viral load was undetectable at that point. Seeing the hieroglyphs, that really inspired me. I wanted to develop an instrument that would make sound visible. Ultimately, I developed the cymoscope instrument, which uses a very small volume of water that is exquisitely sensitive to vibration. When any beautiful sound enters into the water, what I see every day is a beautiful image. Beauty begets beauty. We are 90% water. Think about the membranes around every cell in our bodies receiving a beautiful pattern, a harmonious pattern. Those cells are all gonna be beautifully massaged and feeling, wow, we're being supported here. And there's a very clear change when you compare a healthy cell sound with a cancer cell sound, which produces ugly pattern. So it's a whole new science. Yes, it is. שמי דוקטור ירון סגל, פיזיקה של אטמוספירה, זה הדוקטורט שלי. ב-2001 נולד לנו בן שני, ליר, יהיה לו דלקות בעיניים, שחיכה על הקרנית של העין. זה אמור לכאוב כאבי תופס, זה לא כאב לו בכלל. והרופאה שלו אומרת לנו, כן, זה לא מבין. ואז הם שואלים את ה... מה עושים עם זה? אנשים נוחים עם זה, אין מה לעשות. הסתכלנו באינטרנט, ובוא נגיד ככה, זה לא דבר שאת רוצה לקרוא לפני השינה. זה הרבה ניתוחים. קשיים בתקשורת, ובעיקר מה שיש שם זה תמותה בגיל מאוד מוצא, בין חמש לשמונה שנים. אנחנו קוראים לו שודו, בטוח, כינוי. ליר ואני היינו מטיילים כל ערב 
ובזמן הזה הייתי חושב, איך אני מגיע לשורש הבעיה שלו? לקחתי את הפיזיותרפיה, והבנתי שמדובר בתהליך שמשדר אנרגיות נמוכות, תהליך מאוד מאוד מדויק, שמכוון רק למערכת הספציפית שאותה אני רוצה להפעיל. ומזה הגעתי לתדרים. באיזשהו שלב עלה הרעיון של אם יש פעילות מוחית, היא משדרת החוצה בתדרים מסוימים, אני יכול לשדר פנימה את אותם תדרים, ובעצם להפוך את התהליך הזה. אז אם מערכת מסוימת משדרת בתדר מסוים, אם אני אשדר לה את התדר הזה, היא תחשוב שהיא עבדה, ואז היא תעשה את כל הפעולות שהיא עושה באופן טבעי, על מנת לשקם את עצמה, לחדש את עצמה. מה רע? אוח, אני אוהב אותך, הילד שלי. ואז ב-2006 כתבתי הצעת מחקר ראשונה. הצעתי את זה לכמה קרנות מחקר גדולות בעולם. התשובות שקיבלתי היו מאוד פושרות. היו כאלה שאמרו לי שאני אומר שטויות. ברגע שאת יודעת שהאמת שלך היא נכונה, אין לך הרבה ברירות. את חייבת לנסות את זה כדי להגיד לעצמך ביום שאת עושה חשבון נפש, לא ויתרת על זה. זה יעבוד כי אני יודע שזה יעבוד. ואז ב-2010 עושים ניסוי ראשון ורואים משהו. זה לא מופע כמו שזה נראה. אלה חולדות שעברו פגיעת גב. עצם זה ששידרנו לה מערכת, שדה מגנטי, אחרי חודש אנחנו רואים שיש איזשהו חיבור מחדש של החלק הפגוע לחלק הבריא, ואחרי חודשיים זה חיבור מחדש של חוט השדרה. החולדה הזאת חזרה ללכת. השדה ששידרנו להם עזר להם בתהליך השיקום שלהם. היה לנו שני מטופלים, אחד מהם קיבל טיפול ואחד מהם הסכים לא לקבל טיפול. הבחור הזה לא... קיבל טיפול שלנו, לכן בעצם רואים שהסיבים מתחת לאזור הפגיעה כמעט ונעלמו אחרי ארבעה חודשים. לעומת זאת, הבן אדם שטופל, אחרי הטיפול שלנו רואים עיבוי משמעותי של היכולת הולכה מתחת לאזור הפגיעה, ואיזשהו סוג של חיבור בין החלק הפגוע לחלק הבריא. בעיקרון אמרו לאותו מטופל שהוא לא יכול להזיז את הרגליים אף פעם, בסוף הטיפול הוא גם יצליח להזיז את הרגל. גוגל התלהבה מאיתנו כי אנחנו הלכנו עם מתודה מאוד מאוד קשוחה. מה, אנחנו צריכים לגלות איזה תדרים מתאימים לאיזה תפקוד שאנחנו רוצים, וכשאנחנו לוקחים את זה לניסוי קליני, ומוכיחים שזה אכן עובד. בטח, כל העולם יגיד לא. לא, זה... זה אני אומר את זה, אני אומר את זה הרבה פעמים. כל העולם יכיר לו תודה. כי אם זה לא היה הוא, זה, זה לא היה. It's a human cardiac cell contracting, beating. By this sensor, we are recording this trace here. It's a vibrational code. We can listen to the sound produced by this vibration. When this sound was given to non-differentiated human stem cell, after two weeks, the cells transform it into beating myocardial cell. These are cardiac myocytes derived from human stem cells. They became exactly like the cells from which we recorded the sound. My main work in regenerative medicine is in trying to, to fix a broken heart. You see, the field is all around you. Field wants harmony. And what that truly means is that unbalance in your chemistry will result from unbalance in your personality. You've heard everything that I have had to say about the beauty of compassion and what compassionate action means. And you listen and you listen. There are those who said, well, I'd like to harmonize, but I've had a whole life of a habit. This is just the way I work. So right behind your forehead is a lump of brain called prefrontal cortex. This is the conscious mind. The conscious mind has wishes, desires, 
aspirations. What do you want from your life? Creative. Conscious mind is about 10%. The rest of the brain, 90%, is called the subconscious mind. The subconscious mind is primarily habits. And the fundamental habits didn't come from me. The last trimester of pregnancy and the first seven years of your life, your brain is operating at a low vibrational frequency called theta. And theta is hypnosis. How do you learn to be a member of a family and a community and a culture? You watch other people. You focus on your family, see how they do everything. You learn from everybody else. So the programs that you get for the first seven years are not yours. They came from other people and they pass that on to you. But the problem is it's not just the previous generation, the generation before, the generation before, the generation. So we pass down through the family. Here's the problem, big time. Science has found that 95% of our life, we're thinking. When the conscious mind is thinking, it's not paying attention. When the conscious mind is not paying attention, the subconscious program is the default. Well, if you understand that, then it says only 5% of the time you're running your life with your creative mind, the wishes and the desires and what you want, 5%, 95% of your life is coming from the program. Yeah, but the program is not your wishes and desires, it's other people's behavior. 95% of the day you are playing programs that psychologists tell us are limiting, disempowering, self-sabotaging. All of us, every one of us, every day, plays programs that we don't see and they're not ours. All we see is the result. And we go, oh my goodness, this is not what I wanted. Yeah, but this is what you created. This is something that changed my life. I was playing in a hotel and playing all that dance music, the things that everyone plays. I was really depressed. Where am I gonna go from here playing another hotel? How can I help people? I came home and I hugged the big maple tree in our front yard. And I asked that tree, how come you are so powerful? You're so tall, majestic, and beautiful. And this wasn't a thought. This, I heard this in my ears. The tree says to me, because I never doubted that I was a tree, never doubt that you're the master. Yeah. You know, I didn't wake up the next morning and suddenly I was this, this great composer and I was, you know, I had to work on myself because I still had to get rid of the baggage. And it's taken many years. How we limit ourselves. Oh, I'm too short for this, I'm, I'm a woman, I'm not a man. No, if you say something great about yourself, you're recognizing the God within, and that's so important. I was married very early. It, I was too young, it didn't work out. I was there 10 years, and at one point it's like, out. And it was so painful to get out that every day when I would shave, I would go, I'll never get married again. I'll never get married again. So 17 years, then I ended up meeting my partner, Margaret. Every time we'd go on a date, I would say, if you're looking for a relationship, it's not me. But if we have a good time today, then we'll probably go out tomorrow. At some point, we both started living day by day. We're living in the honeymoon, life is beautiful, everything is great, heaven on earth. And I'm thinking about going to do my job. She comes up and asks me a simple loving question. And I turn around and go, blah, blah, blah. And she looks at me and goes, who are you? I didn't see what I did, I just, it was automatic. Oh, yeah, I was doing my father. Oh, no, I was doing my mother. Oh, no, I could see it. Both of us, knowing about the subconscious, 
not getting into arguments about it, we both started to understand we could change these behaviors. I've been living with Margaret in a honeymoon state for 18 years. Not just that my relationship is beautiful, my life has become beautiful. Have you felt it yet? The profundity of this trip. It's just another tourist area, right? You're going to remember this time. If you look at humanity, you haven't learned the basic. Hatred begats hatred. War creates war. The human nature is not wise. It hasn't figured out the basis of love. The love, love is the glue that holds the universe together. We have two satellites in the Northern Hemisphere and each satellite will send back a signal and every 24 hours in the day, the signals will ebb and they'll flow. The, the strength of the field will ebb and flow in a very similar way. One day, the field's just spiked right off the chart. The scientists said, what on earth is happening to create this spike? It was precisely the field spiked at 9 a.m., 15 minutes after the first plane hit the first tower of the World Trade Center, September 11, 2001, many people of the Earth found that we were more of a family. They held one another, they cried together, they loved one another, at least for a few days. And scientists attribute that closeness to the strength of the magnetic fields. This has led to a project that is called GCI, the Global Coherence Initiative, headed up by the Institute of Heart Math. There are a series of Earth-based probes that are feeding the data of the magnetic field of the Earth. You know, there's a saying, the still small voice of the heart. In reality, the voice of the heart is not so still and so small. It's just that the noise of the mind is so loud. The magnetic field produced by the heart is about 100 times stronger than the magnetic field produced by the brain. We can measure the heart's field about a meter, about three feet from the body you can measure a brain wave about an inch away. The heart, through our nervous system, sends far more neural information up to the brain than the brain sends to the heart. And these signals that the heart sends to the brain have profound influences on brain function. They go to every major center in the brain. I'm going to share with you techniques that I've learned from the monks and the nuns and the shamans and the mystics that I've worked with in addition to heart math research. Okay, so now I'm inviting you to close your eyes. I invite you to allow your awareness to move from your mind into your heart. Touch your heart center gently. Slow your breathing. A little bit slower than usual. Five seconds on the inhale. Five seconds on the release. Five seconds on the inhale. Pause. Five seconds, release. You're creating a very, very sacred space in your body. It's the connection between your heart and your brain. When we can create coherence between the heart and the brain, we create signal that can be measured electrically, 0 0.10 hertz, it's a very low frequency. When we get coherent, physiological, lots of things we can measure how the heart and brain are becoming more synchronized, but we're also accessing intuition. And when we are in optimum coherence, we are connected to the magnetic field of the earth. So we don't necessarily have to go to quantum effects and all of this. We all live within a magnetic field here on Earth. Our heart's magnetic fields are coupled to the Earth's magnetic field, and it's the big carrier wave. We're doing some innovative experiments to ask that question and prove it. So one of the first studies in California, 
Some of the volunteers were in the southern part of the state, some in central, some in north, and they were going about their normal lives for 30 days. What we found is this group of people's heart rhythms was synchronized, a slow wave synchronization. How can this be? The only thing that could explain this was if they were synchronizing to a signal that they were all exposed to. And that turned out to be the resonant frequencies in the Earth's magnetic field. The next question was, was this happening globally? So we had groups of 20 people in five countries, California, Saudi Arabia, Lithuania, New Zealand, and in the UK. We had all the groups around the world do the meditation together at the same time. 15 minutes, the group globally became more synchronized in their local groups to each other, but they also became more synchronized to the Earth's magnetic field in a significant way. In fact, the data has even surprised us that we are far more interconnected and synchronized with the Earth's magnetic fields than we ever would have predicted. Back in 2008, I decided to see if we could use our consciousness to lower violence in war-torn areas. So we decided to send intention over eight days to Sri Lanka, which at the time was going through a 25-year war. You can scroll down this page and look at the data of the peace intention in Sri Lanka. You can see there's a fairly steady trend away from what should be just a horizontal random walk along that black line in the middle of the graph. What is the significance of it being sort of under the line? Does that mean anything? We've seen that numerous times. In fact, it's now become a kind of prediction that we make for great mass uh, gatherings for, of people. The really weird thing about this is that people aren't gathered. They're actually sitting in front of their individual computer screens everywhere in the world. We had participants on this experiment from about 80 countries around the globe. What was really interesting was that a few months after that, that 25-year intractable war was over. Did we do this? What you need to do in order to start claiming that maybe consciousness had an effect is repeat over and over and over again. So we replicated it for the first time in 2011 to mark the 10th anniversary of 9-11. We'd send intention to lower violence in two southern provinces in Afghanistan. What did you find? We found the same, Lynn. <laughs> the data here, driven in the direction of negative going trend in both cases, the larger span of time and also the very concentrated, focused intention period. It was evident that violence in those two provinces had plummeted to levels that were far lower than before. So that was fascinating, and we ran one in Washington, D.C. Again, we lowered violence by about a third. That was just really confirmed again in September, October 2017, sending intention to lower violence in an area of St. Louis, the most violent street in America. In this case, we have a little bit of a positive trend, but then it takes on the very characteristic negative trend that we've seen for these kinds of experiments. A professor of statistics, Dr. Jessica Utz from the University of California, she provided an analysis. Crime went up in three areas. The only thing that went down and went down hugely, it was by 43% compared to the year before, was violent crime in our area of focus, Fairground. It really says a lot about what group mind could possibly be. Everybody has always understood that we're connected in this way. Consciousness is not just a electrical activity in your head, but it uh, is a kind of wonderful uh, composition of heart and mind and soul and spirit. When you put that all together, what we find is that science, using the best techniques of the 20th and now the 21st century, has borne out the deepest truths of our most cherished and ancient spiritual traditions, saying, we are connected to one another, we're connected to all things, and what we think and what we feel is important in our lives, it's important in this world. During the last years, in the late 1980s, the Cold War, 
When the two superpowers at that time, the former Soviet Union and the United States of America, they came this close to doing the unthinkable and to unleashing nuclear weapons upon this world and civilian populations in a way that we've never seen. And I found myself working in the industry hoping that that would never happen. By day and by night, I found myself researching the ancient texts of our past, the Hebrew traditions, the Egyptian traditions, the Andean traditions, the Sumerian traditions, all of the ancient wisdom, because I believe that those who have come before us left us the key to prevent the war that so many people believed we will still have. For that reason, my journey has taken me to some of the most remote, isolated, magnificent, pristine, beautiful places remaining in the world today, in the monasteries, in the libraries, and with the shaman, and the healers, where they preserved the wisdom that we're only beginning to understand. One evening, I climbed to the top of Mount Sinai, and I was alone, and as the last rays of the sun set behind the desert, the beauty overwhelmed me. Uh, and this feeling welled up inside of me. I asked myself a question, and it was about my life and my role in the world. If I left this world in this moment, if I died now, and I looked back on my life and knew I could never come back, would I feel complete with this lifetime? And before the question was even finished, this feeling inside of me was screaming, no, no, I would not feel complete. That something, something I had yet to accomplish. And that day became the reference point by which I gauge every choice, every decision, every relationship, every job, every career, everything I've done from that moment, because a lot of beautiful opportunities cross my path. They're all beautiful, but which one will help me get closer to my yes? We now come to Qumran, the place where over 960 documents ultimately were found some of them 2,200 years old. One of the most powerful documents, the War Scroll. It says that from the time the first humans have walked this earth, there have been beings who are what are called the Watchers. The Watchers are the ones that record with objectivity, the sons of lightness and the sons of darkness. In the end, one last great conflict between darkness and light. And the texts give us a choice. Will we perpetuate this cycle of darkness, suffering, and war? Or will we wake up and choose a new cycle, a cycle of peace and cooperation? They always give us a choice. Will we choose peace? On one platform, there's what we will call dark consciousness. On one other platform, light consciousness. Two years, we told you, be ready for the dark. It will not give up without a battle. And now the battle is here. It's all over the news. Everything that they are doing is calculated to scare you to death. Fear is black. If you shine your light and staying out of fear, the whole world will be brighter for it. Nothing can survive your light. Nothing. The evening is here. 
Not too far away is the Dead Sea. The breeze blows, the chill of the air is coming. We sit in a profound place, an ancient place. For me to give this the final message of the Israeli series. Have you ever wondered, Jew, what is the anti-Semitism about? What would create this? The conquerors would turn their eyes upon you and wipe you out, destroy the temples, or try genocide. Listen, Israeli, this is your field. So it is we start the journey. The city on the hill is where you are. This is and always has been the symbol for the new Jerusalem in a world of peace. I got three different cells and they're three individuals. One individual is Muslim, another individual is Jewish, Another individual is Christian. Where's the difference come from? The difference is programming. Why is it important? The source is the same. All the channels we've given you in the last week have been profoundly given in love. In love. The term, the chosen ones, refer to the Jews. Chosen to bring this planet a monotheistic God, a one God. That the one God would then be seen by the planet and eventually the entire planet would be unified with one God. But you're not done. And the next part is as hard as the first because it is planetary as well. Dear ones, listen clearly. You are chosen to bring peace here. When will they say it's going to be so difficult? It's not just us, you know, it's them. The situation is more than difficult. It's untenable. There is no solution that you can see. But there is. And you do it with consciousness. That's what you're chosen for. The hardest thing the planet will ever see. Peace in the region. עשרות אלפי אנשים עומדים להצטרף אלינו ממש בעוד עשר דקות. כל העולם, מעיראק, מאיראן, ממרוקו, ברזיל, פיליפינים, ארצות הברית, איפה לא? כולם עם כוונה אחת. כולם, אני אהיה מושתרק. שלום במזרח התיכון. סלאם בשרק אאוסר. דוקטור בעדורי מאינדיה, מהודו. מבקש לברך אותנו. Good wishes to you and to everyone. Blessings and love to Israel and all surrounding countries. So God bless you all. Is Jerusalem on? Jerusalem is on! 
there. Yes. Hi, Jerusalem. We have people from so many different countries. Saudi Arabia. Yes, there they are. Wow. We've got the UAE. We've got Abu Dhabi. Let's see you. And we've got um, Tunisia from Safras. We've got Bahrain. We've got Kuwait City. We have Jordan. Amen. Yeah. Oh, the loud ones from Jordan. And we've got Oman, Muscat. So we have people from all over the Middle East coming together, Arabs and Israelis, for a, a historic event. And we also have many thousands of people from all over the world participating on YouTube. One of the people responsible for this event is Dr. Salam Al Rashid. And thanks to him, we are broadcasting in Southern England in Smartways Studio. So are you ready to begin now, everybody? एक चिंतन करिए कि एक स्वर्णिम आभा इस पृथ्वी पे चारों ओर फैल रही है Our intention is to lower violence and restore peace in the old city of Jerusalem by at least 10% or more. Imagine it with your five senses. See people putting down their weapons, see people restoring peace there, see people hugging each other hugging strangers reaching across the aisle hold those intentions in your mind as you imagine yourself holding the hands of everyone on either side of you if you're watching on youtube imagine you're holding the hands of everybody all the thousands of people on this call Can you feel the connection? Are you seeing peace? In your own time, open up your eyes and come on back into the room. Anybody like to talk to us about how that felt? Yes. So we have someone from a man. A man. How are you? Uh, it's amazing experience. We all here crying. Our tears uh, falling down. Like a commercial that you see on the road, and it was <laughs> written, "The peace is already here." Yes. <laughs> Jayat Jeda in Saudi Arabia. I saw myself there, and I felt very strong love for the Jews, in spite of our raising up to hate the Jews. We live in Jerusalem. We know it personally. This is so emotional, and I've seen the four quarters of the old city as the four rooms of my personal heart. Yes, you're on Abu Dhabi. Israelis are dancing, the Palestinians, they hug each other, and we are with the, the Israelis. Like, we share peace and love. Tunisia. Yes, Tunisia. I saw a lot of children running, and there is a lot of loud voice of laughing. You took me to the place I really love. I saw there uh, freedom and lots of people uh, laughing, lots and lots, lots of joy and happiness. I wish I could stay there. I wish I didn't come back. My name is Lady from Jerusalem. It's so overwhelming the possibility to be connected with you, our sisters, in Amman and in Damascus and in Iran and all over. We are thousands saying enough. It's about time to unite. We are one. It's time of compassion. My name is Fatima Salemi, and the peace 
in Arabic means Salam and my name is Salami. So I feel in peace, I feel in love, I love you, Our God is my God, I love you. I was unable to come here. So I asked my son to come to Jerusalem and to have this measurement. In the moment when the signal increased, it was at the Jaffa Gate, and it was after people finished meditation. Oh, there is no war between us. There is only love. Number one, it was the beginning of the experiment. But then after they had this collective meditation, it increased tremendously, really big difference. And number three, it is same place, but measured a year before, but it's very unstable signal. It means that under the influence of collective meditation of people, we have balancing of the environment. What did the water respond? We had five sets of readings. Baseline, the water that just comes out of the tap. You had expansion, a contraction. Bigger expansion, shrinking again. Inconsistency. The meditation began. Suddenly up, suddenly down, suddenly shooting up and going down. The water, when the experiment ended, various levels of spikiness. After the meditation was done, Everybody shared their heart, tears came out, deep compassion, deep love. The luminous quality of the water was the brightest, consistent, harmonious, and symmetrical. Woke up in the morning, there's various ups and downs. It went even lower than the baseline. And why? This water received all this love and all of a sudden, C'est la vie! Everybody is gone! I would like to ask you something. To sing the next lines with me. In the honor of that here in Jerusalem and here in Israel, there is more than one language. So I ask you to help me sing the next lines. When Dr. Baduri started chanting, instrument Sputnik staying in the same room was able to detect decrease of parameters. When he started silent uh, meditation, it was even much stronger. When people meditate, it decreases the level of radioactivity, it decreases the level of noise, electromagnetic noise, and it makes everything much more harmonized. You can sing both, come. We looked at the data. It consists of all 32 instruments placed all around the world, mostly Europe and America, but some in Australia, some in Japan. And you can see in this case, very characteristic trend exactly during the event itself. What your work does that's so amazing is Western mind needs proof. When we uh, do the statistics, we gradually gather 500 experiments into one composite database. And when we look at the statistics for that, the departure from what's expected for random number generators is what the physicists call seven sigma. The chance of that happening is one in a trillion. It's basically a way of saying that we're pretty sure there's an effect. The charts and the graphs can show the field is real. It exists. I want to take you the rest of the way. You look into the eyes of the infant for the first time. What do you say? Mom, what could you say? What could you say? I'm going to be with you all your lives. I'm going to protect you. I'm going to love you. There is no measure to this. 
There's no measure emerging from you. Life, put on your chest, open its eyes, and there he or she is. Oh. The scientists can't go there with the charts and the graphs and all that they have, but I can, you see. It came for science, you're getting love. And then you find out that love may be a complement of science. That's why I came. Perhaps that's why you came too.